All right. You ready? Okay, so to continue where we left off before we went to eat, we stopped at Menes. And remember, I showed everyone this face because I like the children to know that this is the actual. He wasn't here before, so I'm going to repeat this. <laughs> this was the actual face of the actual the first pharaoh of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt. So when you get all of this other literature and school and Sunday school who have these European or Arab pharaohs, we don't know where they came from unless they came three, about 3,000 years later with the Greeks. But this is the face of the first pharaoh of the very first dynasty of ancient Egypt, 3100 BCE. My painter's doing some work, so some of these are uh, yeah, 3,100 BCE. Okay, then we move on to Cabral. Uh, Cabral was probably one of our, if not the most brilliant, all-around strategist, uh, warfighter, uh, cultural uh, promoter that we had. He basically led his army to break the Portuguese army, breaking their will, draining their finances, and finally forcing them to have what they had a revolution in Portugal, actually, where they... Uh, they were losing so much money and people and everything that the people of Portugal r rose up. That brought about the end of the whole Portuguese colonial regime. So Angola, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, uh, Mozambique, all of those freed after that. Uh, if you ever have a chance to read some of his books, Return to the Source, uh, Unity and Struggle, you find out not only was he brilliant militarily, he's brilliant culturally and intellectually and everything else. That's why he's one of my big people here. And going, staying with big people here, uh, we have Imhotep. Imhotep was uh, probably the world's first known multiple genius. He was a scribe. He was um, the world's first medical doctor. He was an architect. He was an astronomer and all of those kind of things. So when you think about the world's very first medical doctor, we're talking about 2600 BC, which is about 500 uh, years after that first pharaoh. African, Nile Valley, Egypt, Imhotep. I can't, I can't take this. Sorry about the phone ringing. Uh, that's Imhotep. Okay, as I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were coming down the first time, uh, you all had learned about Napoleon. This is Toussaint Just hit the, just hit the side button. Excellent. Uh, we learned about uh, Toussaint Louverture. We learned about uh, uh, Toussaint Louverture, the man who actually led the whole Haitian Revolution, uh, beating Napoleon's army and making them the first republic. This is the only slave nation that's ever won their freedom and taken over and run the nation, which is Haiti. So some people feel like this is still the reason that they are angry with Haiti today. Never give Haiti a break, never get off of Haiti's back. But they beat Napoleon and the British army that went along with it. Uh, if you come from the north of the country, there's Nagbewa. So if you're Mamprusi, Dagomba, some of the rest of them, you will have known or you would have heard of Nagbewa because he was the father even going to the Moshe and Burkina Faso. So this, I put him up here really representing uh, the northerner. Uh, Ose Tutu the first was the first Isantehini or the first Isante king. You probably heard stories if you've been traveling around Ghana about a Confanoche and the golden stool and uh, coming down from the sky and all of that. But this is the very first uh, Isantehini. Uh, Ose Tutu the first. Just north of here in Burkina Faso, we have Thomas Sankara. Sankara was the uh, young, incorruptible leader that they had there in Burkina Faso. Unfortunately, he was taken out by his number two man. One of the reasons we think that he was probably uh, eliminated was because he was one of the few who refused to pay all of this onerous IMF, onerous IMF World Bank debt, which he knew would starve his country and, and not be felt by the so-called debtors. Amenorrhenus, this one is important also. This woman, now we're in Kush. Kush is basically the southern part of the Nile Valley. So southern Egypt, northern Sudan, depending on what you call it back then. 60 to 10 BC. Okay, now 
by now the Romans have finally taken over in Egypt. Remember, we're talking about 3000 uh, BC and the, and the pyramids and all of these, 2000, 1000 BC. So finally, this late in the game, the Romans have taken over in Egypt. They decide they're going to go south. This is uh, Caesar's Roman army. They run into Amenorrhenus. So Amenorrhenus and her people, she's the Kandaki or queen of Cush, were able to stop them in war, push them back into, into what was Egypt proper. And uh, this place remained sovereign for something like 300 more years. So you get an idea that when uh, the military technologies were not so uh, off balance one to the other, and you're just fighting with strategy, courage, and the rest, how, how well we did against these foreign armies. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, Menelik II of Ethiopia. All of the other African nations have been colonized, uh, at least all the ones who have been colonized by force. Uh, Menelik decided he didn't want that for Ethiopia. So when the Italians came, uh, just like the French had come and the British and all of the rest of them to the other African countries, Menelik was prepared for them. He had uh, weapons, he had ammunition, he had trained his troops, he had strategy and uh, they saw themselves as a nation fighting against the Italians. So they were able to repel the Italians. 1896 is a big date with the War of Adua and maintain their sovereignty. And I look at what's going on in Ethiopia today and they are still suffering from the insult that they put upon this European group for maintaining their sovereignty. So look at the pressure Ethiopia is on today from foreign interests, which you're not gonna hear about in the news that you're looking at. <laughs> Uh, Malcolm X, Brother Malcolm X, our black shining prince there in the uh, U.S. <clears throat> if you haven't ever heard Malcolm X speak, you'll see he's one that was really stirring the souls of African people, first there in that country and then beginning to stir the souls around the world. He was, um, you know, an ex-felon. He had a, a CD background, but he turned himself around, became one of the upfront righteous men of our society. Unfortunately, of course, he was killed. Uh, by the same friends, we, we see these movies about all kinds of different uh, strategies, but we know the government and the Nation of Islam, at least some of the people in the Nation of Islam themselves, that all, all were actually working for the government. Uh, so when he was killed, there was all kinds of intrigue. In fact, they just released a man, uh, just exonerated a man just recently for the death of uh, being one of the killers of Malcolm X. Uh, Chesweu of South Africa, uh, another one of the great Zulu kings coming down from the Lion of Shaka. Chesweu, you know, he won some wars. You've seen some of the movies. Really organized, again, his, his Zulu fighters, organized, courageous, and trained. But now you're really seeing where they lost because of the difference in military technology, especially, in the, by the way, the British. He was one of the more uh, recent uh, strong leaders out of, out of Zululand there. Akhenaten, I mentioned uh, Queen Tia in the front. Akhenaten, we know he's, um, if you look at him, generally people will call him, say, the father of monotheism. Uh, we already had something like a monotheism before then, so that's a little bit of a misnomer. But the Abrahamic religions, which is uh, uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, that all come out if you examine them carefully you'll find out a lot of that or almost all of that came out of the spiritual systems that were in the Nile Valley when the story of Moses having left and if you have to remember Moses was an Egyptian so whatever they have to say about him you can start from there and ask yourself what religious or spiritual system did he take out of the Nile Valley and of course Everyone there looks like somebody here. Bob Marley. Hopefully y'all have all heard of Bob Marley. Uh, if you haven't, you've been living on another planet, but uh, liberation musician. And not only was he just brilliant, but uh, of course we know the content of his work uh, pushed Pan-Africanism, peace and power. Yes, indeed. Wangari Maathai at Kenya. Uh, basically, I put her here not just because that she won the Nobel Prize and planted all the trees and all of that, but if you look at a lot of her political philosophy and the pressure she was under there in Kenya by the government because of what she said and what she saw and what she saw our people as being able to accomplish if we had our chance, put her always in trouble with the government. Uh, Sengbe Pie or Senke, some of you saw the movie Amistad. Uh, I'd like the children to know that our Africans 
the African men and women had taken over the ship called the Amistad when it was getting near the U.S. coming through Cuba and tried to steer the ship back to Africa. Back to Africa. So, so many of the youngsters are now trying to get out of Africa. But when we left under those conditions, we were doing everything we could to get back to this place. And that's the lesson of Senke, plus the bravery and all that it took to, to have a mutiny on that ship, the Amistad. Uh, Brother Fred Hampton, chairman of the Black Panther Party of Chicago. If you look, you notice he was killed. He was only 21 years old. Last week, Fred Hampton Jr. was here, which was a very big honor for us. And he took some pictures together, and it was very nice. Uh, Fred Hampton killed for his voice and his influence, kind of like Steve Biko, really like Malcolm. You know, and of course, they were worried about the rise of a black messiah. And there's been a movie out uh, not too recently. Uh, not too long ago about Black Messiah and Judas and the Black Messiah about the killing of Fred Hampton. Uh, Samuel Maharero in Namibia. Uh, the Herero people and the Nama people were basically uh, subjected to a genocide by the Germans there. A very brutal, systematic killing. Uh, a lot of the things that the Germans did here uh, you saw a generation or two later in uh, World War II, I mean the work camps and all of this uh, mass murder techniques, they perfected a lot of them here before they did it again uh, in Europe in World War II. But Marrero, Herrero did everything possible to save his people from that fate. Oliver Tambo, the ANC, um, like so many, they're exiled for so long for their anti-apartheid positions and anti-apartheid struggle. In his case, almost 30 years. But from outside the country, he'd organized uh, money, diplomacy, uh, weapons, and anything else that they had to do to try to get their freedom and try to uh, break that apartheid system. Agostino Neto, Agostino Neto from Angola, he was what we call an Imhotep man because he was uh, multi-talented. He was a medical doctor by profession, but he was also uh, a poet and a writer, and of course the uh, the head of the anti-colonial struggle there in Angola, against the Portuguese, by the way. So I mentioned Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, all of those were Portuguese colonies. Uh, Zabeth, this one, we don't have a lot of information on this young lady, but we know Zabeth, starting at nine years old, she was uh, in Haiti on one of the French slave plantations. She ran away, they caught her, they beat her, they tortured her, she would run away again, over and over again, even though he, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot, but he had that indomitable spirit. You couldn't kill the spirit of someone who truly wants to be liberated are gonna run away until they can run no more, which is basically what happened with her. Somebody said, that's them. <laughs> I got some runaway slaves. <laughs> uh, we'll call the man. I got some here. <laughs> Wow. Get get my uh, cut, you know. They give me a cut when I round, round y'all up. Yeah, check it out. I don't know how y'all got to Africa? Yeah, check it out. <laughs> okay, so you know about the um, in, there's a man Baby Ray in Sierra Leone. Um, he was of the Timne people. What the British used to do, and they did it in Kenya and other places, to raise money for themselves when they got to your land, they would look at your huts and say, okay, we're gonna put a tax on your hut. Mm -hmm. You've been living there for how many generations? And you say, well, no, you can't put a tax on our hut. No, we have to raise pounds sterling or other money. So the only way that you can raise the money to pay the tax on your hut is to come work for us. Mm -hmm. So they would force you into forced labor to give you the... So anyway, my man, Baby Ray, said, let me understand this. Yeah, I think this was... It. My answer is war, you know. <laughs> so he went to war with these people, and that was a great hut tax war in Sierra Leone. Uh, with a lot of success, by the way. Uh, Felix Mumi, uh, this is one you would not have heard of because uh, had not something happened to him, you probably wouldn't remember too much about him, but he was he was like the number two, maybe number three man in Cameroon. You know, of course, he went to Geneva, which is supposed to be such local, I'm sorry, such a um, uh, neutral space and all of that to negotiate. And he went to have his dinner 
and he was poisoned with thallium at his dinner. Uh, it was kind of a long story, but basically he avoided drinking it in the first place because they had put some in there that was enough dosage for him to die a few weeks later. He didn't drink that, but he before he left at the end of the evening, he took another cup and drank it, and that one they had just put a lot in. It killed him that night, so everyone knew that he had been poisoned in Geneva uh, when he went there to negotiate in good faith. So the lesson there is, uh, even if you go to Geneva, be careful who you drink with. Uh, Sekohune, Sekohune was a, of the Pede PDI group uh, near the Nampoko region in South Africa. He was basically known for his skill of fighting against first the Boers, which were the Dutch, and then after that he had to turn around again and of course fight the British. Uh, unfortunately there was some betrayal by a half-brother who had some other designs and you know how that works and so they used him to get rid of Sekohune and as soon as that guy got on the throne he was about 12 minutes in and they got rid of him too so you know well I'm exaggerating but he wasn't there long oh, right. <laughs> may as well have been 12 minutes uh, okay now we know the Shimarenga, the wars of resistance that the uh, people in Zimbabwe fought against the British uh, Nahanda was the spirit leader spirit woman of those wars of resistance uh, when they finally caught her, that was a Shimmeringa number one. And when they finally caught her, uh, they didn't play games. They hung this one because sometimes they send you into exile. Sometimes they do other things. But I believe that her being a spiritual woman, spiritual leader, they decided not to take their eyes off of her. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., we know him as a human. You know, he gets the, the, the um, publicity as a peace-seeking person, and he was. But they don't tell you about his very strong human rights, uh, anti-war, anti-materialism, anti-corruption core of his being. So this is a very principled man who stood up for his principles and at some point they decided he had gotten too far and gone too broadly with his criticisms of the U.S. government and that was his end. Uh, now not only did we have, uh, not only were most of the pharaohs in, in uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, African, all the way until, you know, the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans came in, which was thousands of years after everything was done. Uh, we also had female pharaohs. So Hatshepsut was one of the African female pharaohs of ancient Kemet. Uh, she's known for her uh, broad trading area, uh, all her commercial ventures, all the way into Syria, Ethiopia, and all the other, I mean, uh, Sudan, uh, Somalia, and other places. He's got some very, very impressive uh, uh, temples that are dug, carved out of stone in the mountains there in ancient Kemet. I've never been there, but I've seen a lot of pictures. And it's very grand. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about Kaliderat very quickly of Nubia. Now, once again, Nubia, Kush, all of that is southern Egypt, northern Sudan, if you look at it today. Um, now we're 641 AD. In 641, the Arabs have finally come and taken over in Egypt. So what they tried to do is basically what the Romans before them do, which is to go south, conquer that territory. Well, just like uh, the Romans ran into Amenorrhinus, the Arabs ran into Kaliterat and his people. Uh, they fought to a standstill, pushed them back in Egypt, forced them into a treaty not to invade or not to disturb them. And that treaty lasted about 700 years. So that gives you an idea. When we had treaties in those days, when we won our wars, uh, we were able to have the power to, to enforce the treaty and make them stick. Nowadays, we can never even get a treaty. Uh, Muhammad Ali, of course, we consider him to be the greatest of all times, uh, not only for his boxing skill, but of course his courage and what he was willing to sacrifice as a man just not to go into a, a wartime scenario with the people who he knew were not on his side. Lat your joke. If you ever get to Senegal, you'll see a place called Kair. It's kind of like a fishing village, but it was an empire at the time. He was the Damal, or the king uh, of that empire. Of course, the French were there, and they wanted to run their railroads through his territory. He said no. Big battles ensued. He finally died in battle. He was trying to protect his territory uh, from the French. And you see the name Joke. You saw Sheikh Anta Joke was a very common surname in Senegal. What, no better way to go, right? There you go. All right, there you go. Uh, Antonio Maceo, uh, if you recall, the Cubans 
had to fight against the Spanish in their war of liberation. <clears throat> uh, one of the two great generals that fought against the Spanish and led the troops against the Spanish was Antonio Maceo. They call him the um, bronze titan. Now he's a big uh, bronze colored black man. And if you go to Cuba today, which I haven't been, David Bomani's been, they say that he's well represented in terms of uh, his hero. Uh, Patrice Lumumba, Patrice Lumumba wasn't the uh, uh, president or prime minister that long of Congo because he was assassinated again by, uh, at the behest of Western forces. Because one of the things he was trying to do was take control of the mineral resources of his land, especially in the Katanga region, southern part. Um, but anyway, I use this also as an opportunity to let the children know about the rubber, the 10 million Africans who died in the Congo uh, trading rubber. It, not trading rubber, but harvesting rubber. So the way they would do it, they would take the wife or someone hostage and they send the husband out to, uh, to harvest rubber. If he didn't bring him back the right amount of time, they would cut her hand or her arm off. So you see all of these pictures of these people holding the hands and the arms, you've probably seen them in the Congo, of all of these women and children uh, because their fathers or brothers or uncles didn't bring them back enough rubber. 10 million deaths. They reduced that population by 10 million people. Of course, the Belgians were the ones, King Leopold, uh, responsible for this. But when you say the Belgians, it, it wasn't just them. Everybody was in on it. Because every, this is the time when rubber was, was premium. Cars were coming online, bicycles all over the world. And that was the cash cow of the, of the time. We have time, we even try to show uh, like some of the Belgians, you know, they're famous for chocolate. You know, they would have these chocolate little hands. Beans. You've seen that? Mm -hmm. Hands made just, of chocolate, just, you know, mm -hmm. just representing the ones that they cut off during the rubber trade. So these are your development partners I'm talking about. Yeah. In Kwabanika, Tanzania, uh, the Germans, he had to struggle against the Germans, and, and he was of the he he -A -T -A -T group in Tanzania, Tanganyika, really, uh, at the time. And, you know, of course, he's a successful fighter, too, but he had uh, the misfortune of getting caught, getting captured. And when they captured and killed him, they cut his head off and sent the head to Germany. And then they kept it there for quite a while. And then when the Germans lost to the British in World War I, the British took the head and they kept it forever and ever. And then finally the people of Tanzania were able to get it back. What they were doing with that head, I don't even want to speculate. This is a brand new edition, although uh, the space has been here for a while. Uh, Robert Mugabe. Now, Robert Mugabe, uh, BBC will tell you he is absolute worst African on earth as BBC. Right? Whenever BBC says this is a terrible, horrible person, he immediately becomes a candidate for the wall. Because you got to ask, well, why do they hate the man so much? Now, you can make arguments about him staying too long, about his, uh, his, his way of managing the country late, late in it. But this is a man who fought for the Navy, was jailed for a long time, fought a guerrilla war, trying to get uh, sovereignty back to Zimbabwe for the people. He's been through hell and back. And then he, after they quote unquote won, they went into uh, a negotiation agreements in Lancaster there with the, with the British who said they were gonna be willing seller, willing buyer to get the land back to the people. Of course, they lied about it. When the 10 years was up, they reneged on the whole deal. And so what do you want the man to do? Of course, he's gonna have to start taking the land back. And once he started taking the land back because the agreements had been broken, he became the pariah of the West. Before that, if you really look at it, he was, uh, they, they liked him because he was a go slow guy. He didn't take it all right at the end when the wars were over. He went into a deal with it. They reneged on the deal. The man said, no, we got to take it back. And then he became, you know, public enemy number one. Got to get your land back. And a lot of that land they got back, by the way. They have it. Elijah Muhammad, you know, he's got all kinds of, uh, you know, blotches on his record. And so it makes it hard for some people to see him up here. So I'm very sensitive to that. However, then I stop and I say, okay, let's look at the Nation of Islam during this time with their, with their, uh, you know, businesses and their trucking and their banking and this and all of that. 
Think of all of the young brothers, they've been pulling out of prison, think of they got the bakeries, papers. You, you, even today, if you really, really, to, even today, want to just pick up a paper that probably has more truth in it about black life in the world than anyone else, you gotta, you gotta pick up the final call. call. I mean, like it or not, even today. He missed you for Yeah. Even today, but that's, uh, you know, today's nation of Islam is not yesterday's nation of Islam, but if you try to imagine, what do we have as close to a nation inside that nation after this? You didn't. So, I mean, you can criticize them, but then somebody else with all of these higher uh, ethical would have, you have to also show me the nation that they tried to build for black people. And I haven't seen it. Find me any perfect nation. Exactly. Well, you know, or a woman. You? Okay. I, mean, uh, okay. <laughs> I got a couple of them. <laughs> All right. Uh, I had to be Wells, of course. A lot of the children thought this was Michael Jackson. Yeah. Before, yeah. We, before we put the uh, words up here. You know, like I say, somewhere around Thriller. You know. But, uh, no, I had to be Wells, anti lynching crusader, after some of her close friends and family were lynched. That really she set her in the motion to, uh, to follow this for the rest of her life. And one of the things we're able to do with the youngsters is that we're able to show them, of course, a lot of you have seen the pictures uh, without sanctuary, the book of all of these lynching pictures where uh, here they were lynching these two charred Africans and the kids and everybody else down in the South, not just the South, but all around, we're having a picnic and a party and putting postcards out with these, with these days. And this is not one, two, 10, 50, I mean, just that book alone is just chock full of these pictures. They're all over the place. So you ask yourself what was going on in the mind. So I like our children to know, you know, what we've been through. What we've been through. Because a lot of times they think somehow we've been over there surfing and now we're back with some money. It's like, it's not like that. Okay. Uh, Donna Kello, this is another one that depends on who you are, you'll call this one controversial because it was a bloody revolution. Uh, the, um, in Zanzibar there, the African native to the place had been under the dominance of the Omani Arabs for literally for generations. And any appeal to uh, fairness or what have you has gone unheeded for all of those uh, generations. So the black people in the country finally rose up with the Afro Shariza party, led by John Akello. Very bloody revolution to get their land back, but they got it back. And uh, after that, Zanzibar uh, connected with Tanganyika to become Tanzania. That's John Akello. Fela, Fela, Fela Kute, a fearless, brilliant, revolutionary musician. Um, you see some of the story of Fella, you see how they prosecuted Fella, everything they did to him, but he was so courageous and determined that he just come back with another album uh, more vicious and insulting than the last one. So yeah. this man, they say he died of AIDS, although his 20-something wives somehow didn't contract it, but you know, we'll, you know that sounds good, I don't want to say Standing up has a cost, you know? Standing up has a cost, y'all. Zumbia, Brazil. Uh, Africans in Brazil, of course, call it, uh, enslaved by the Portuguese on those mass plantations in Brazil, but when they escaped, they would get their own colonies, their own groups together. They call them uh, quilombos. So the quilombos were those societies of escaped Africans, usually in the mountains. Palmares was the biggest Colombo, longest running Colombo for about a hundred years uh, there in Brazil. Uh, Zumbi was their leader. Staying with Brazil for just a second, uh, Nascimento, for some of us who were um, always interested in the Afro-Brazilian culture, history, politics, and everything, there was no better source uh, than Nascimento. Uh, available information, he was writing, and he was an artist uh, in, in his own right. That's Nascimento. Uh, Njoma, he's the only one who was actually not an ancestor because I didn't know he wasn't an ancestor when we did this wall. Because he was already, it's 1929, but he was still kicking. Uh, of course, Namibia had to struggle against uh, South Africa because they colonized into Southwest Africa and Swapo and the, and the anti colonial um, army. That's who he led. That's who he led, and that's uh, where he became president, of course, after the clump.
Colonials, they spent a period in uh, Booker T. Washington, for a lot of you all who think Booker was a little, a little questionable, <laughs> um, there's reason to, to question some of the things, but I think Tyreen Wright and some other ones have taken the covers off of a lot of other things that Booker T. Washington was doing for our people uh, under the radar in terms of funding, organization, a lot of other things. And plus, uh, you know, Tuskegee is still there. And he did his part. So we kept, we kept him. Now, B.B. Uh, King here with his guitar, Lucille. Uh, he's in the moment. So this is my daddy's favorite blues man. So he automatically made the ancestor well. And that's my man. He deserved it anyway, but my daddy gave you that extra push. Now you want to talk about brilliance, African brilliance, you won't go better than Walter Rodney of Guyana. This man was able to, uh, I don't know if you've ever read the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, one of our uh, best publications ever. The man was just brilliant all the way around in terms of history, politics. Unfortunately, um, he was killed in Guyana in a political murder with some of uh, internal politics. Uh, Amina, 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 what, who is she, what is she doing? Right here. She is a warrior queen um, that, from the Hausa region of Nigeria. Yes. Okay, turn around. This is Amina telling me about herself. <laughs> what about you, girl? What's up with you? Well, Why are we calling your name? Queen Amina you? is a warrior queen, mm -hmm. and she led the Zaza Warriors. That's all. Zaza. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's why. And they I have know. these huge walls called Amina Walls that are still in existence that basically circumscribe the area of her huge, huge uh, empire. I mean, a lot of it is down now, but you can still find pieces of it. So this is uh, the Calvary. Uh, expert. My daughter does a very nice presentation on Amina. I'll have to find it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Queen. Eduardo Mamlani, this is another one. All he had to do was relax. You know, he had a PhD from one of the great colleges in America, Northwestern, I believe. But of course, his people in Mozambique were being crushed uh, by the Portuguese. So he started the uh, Free Limo, uh, which was the anti colonial movement. He was a mentor, more or less, of a, a Michelle Samari we talked about down there. Unfortunately, he was also killed. Uh, a lot of people were killed uh, in a parcel bomb. He opened the parcel, the bomb blew up, and that was the end. Garrett Morgan, is Bomani here? Mm -hmm. Little Bomani. Little on the bus. Oh, he's on the bus. Okay, I was going to let him tell you who Garrett Morgan is. Garrett Morgan is um, an inventor, and a lot of you. No, he invented the traffic signal, invent, invented the uh, gas mask that the um, yeah the gas mask that they wear in the military and they don't military and of course the firemen and all of the rest. Uh, we don't know about that hairdo, but we let the brother go for now. Uh, Franz Fanon, you notice when we get down here talking about a lot of things in the Caribbean. All of these brilliant uh, thinkers that came out of the Caribbean, small nations, but made definitely intellectual contributions, no more so than Franz Sinan of Martinique. If you ever read The Wretched of the Earth, The Black Face, White Mask, you just know the man's brilliance in terms of assessing our thinking, uh, assessing violence, and how it, it affects imagination, not imagination, but uh, motivation and behavior. Um, he was a psychiatrist himself, died of cancer, 36 years old. John Chalimbwe, this is another one. He was uh, studying theology and all in the U.S., but finally when he got back to his native Malawi, he had to go back into the, into the fighting mode because the British, of course, had absolutely uh, no problem being ungodly. Uh, Seiko Ture of Guinea. A lot of the Ghanaians know him because he was the one who was uh, taking Kwame Nkrumah in when he was deposed and made, it him, a co made him a co-president. But also when the French ask everyone at the end of the colonial period, do you want to stay in the French community? A lot of them said yes. Most of them said yes. He said no. The French tried to destroy his nation, the infrastructure and all of that because he refused to be part of their 
community again, but uh, fortunately they're able to rebuild. Uh, Ami Sasser, who was probably the intellectual godfather of the the African um, of the African French speaking uh, nations, you may have heard of a movement called Negritude. Negritude was a, a African uh, Afro French or French speaking uh, literary movement. And Ami Sasser was. So when you read Shikanta Jump and these other people who were in Paris at the time. He was really their intellectual father. He was a, a, a poet, a very well-known poet and writer of his own. Samari Touré, of course, uh, was probably the most effective struggling against the French in West Africa, uh, uh, resisting in resistance of the slave, uh, the slave trade. I mean, in resistance of the colonial uh, takeover. Kwame Touré, who used to be Stokely Carmichael, uh, born in Trinidad, another uh, brilliant person coming out of the Caribbean. Uh, we know him as a young black power uh, advocate growing up. And uh, Guinea is where he ended up in Africa. He was married to Mary McKeever for a while. You know, he started the All African People's Revolutionary Party. It was a revolutionary. So he took Kwame from Kwame Nkrumah. He took Ture from Seiko Ture and changed his name from... Stokely Carmichael, the Kwame Turek. We have our great, great, great scholar, teachers, John Henry Clark, Yosef Vinyakinen. Some of you have probably had the pleasure of being in their presence and, and seeing their work. And just, uh, if there were ever teachers in the world, that's two of them right there. Um, the sister who... Uh, Sandra. Sandra. She was telling, uh, I just found out that these two taught her in high school. She just, uh, Marimba just told me that. In high school. Wow. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. So that's how long they've been in the game. Wow. I mean, teaching and doing their thing. Now everybody asks me, if, uh, where's Mandela? Where's Mandela? We're still so, trying to find out. She's right here. <laughs> there you go. She's right here. So you know our sister Winnie's gonna get our love if she didn't get the love of everybody oh, else. Oh yeah, tell me. Because you know, we gotta think about what she's been through and how when the whole thing was said and done, you know, her name was in darkness and everyone else was in the light. But we don't accept that. We know what the sister went through, what she had to do, and uh, she's going to get her props from us. Now, everybody always asks me, where is Man Nelson Mandela? And I'm sure along the line we'll, we'll do Nelson, but I wanted to give Winnie the props first. So that's what we're doing. And by the way, um, you know, well, we Nelson still haven't got the land back. Yeah, Nelson will have to make it, you know. Some right. people couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. 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 And of course, uh, Francis Crick, Francis Wilson, Wilson. Uh, just so you have some idea about uh, not only white supremacy, but also uh, the uh, the Jewish people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know if any of you ever saw her debate on Tony Brown's journal. It's a classic if you can find it with Shockley, with all his with all of Shockley's theories. Okay, we might ask her to say something about those two in just a second. You might have to say something. So you might have to say something about Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben. Well, that's Francis Chris Wilson. He don't understand. No, I, I just heard she was just, remember, okay, was just so telling good. me about it. I was like, what? That you were, they taught you in high school. At Harlem Prep. That is, at Harlem Prep. And that Dr. is amazing. Uh, George Simmons. And George Simmons. And from the know, Caribbean. We know all the same people. Oh, yeah. And yeah. she just reconnected me with my best friend in high school. After and how many I'm, years? <laughs> 50. Wow. Mm -hmm. I saw you up there, to, uh, tears rolling down yes. your cheeks. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Yes. All happens at the ancestors. The ancestors, right. yes. the ancestors bringing us together. So, you anybody have any questions? All right, if we don't have any questions, thank everybody for coming. Thank you.